And I'm, I am just so thrilled to have Steve uh, address us and talk about his book, which was recently published, uh, Beauty, Memory, Unity, A Theory of Proportion in Architecture and Design. Uh, Steve Bass is an architect. Uh, he's been in practice since uh, 1974. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Pratt Institute and a Master of Arts from the Royal College of Art in London, uh, where he studied under the direction of Dr. Keith Critchlow and was a participant in the initial uh, Prince of Wales uh, summer course in architecture. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, he was a visiting professor uh, of architecture at Notre Dame University. And he's currently a fellow of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art in uh, New York City, where he teaches on the theme of proportion and geometry in design. He's written many articles and, and written this uh, really important book that I hope you all uh, have a chance to uh, add to your library. The uh, ICA Utah makes these lectures possible through the generous donations and support of our patrons and members. And we invite all of you to uh, go to classassist.org and become a member of the ICAA and support uh, this mission of spreading the, uh, the knowledge of the classical tradition uh, broad and deep uh, amongst a, a wide audience. And uh, we wanna thank all of our sponsors and, and thank our patrons. I especially mention uh, FFKR Architects, uh, our, our annual sponsor. Uh, <laughs> this uh, lecture is being recorded and we uh, would love to hear your questions. And if you would use the, the chat for that, just type in your questions into the chat as we go and we'll moderate a, a question and answer at the end. Steve's presentation will go for about an hour, and then we'll do about 10 minutes of Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to Steve Bass. Paul, thank you very much uh, for the invite, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy also to uh, hear about what you're doing uh, at, the, um, at the school, uh, at your new school. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that uh, the, the classical system is being taught again um, at, at a degree granting uh, institution. So I'm very happy to be here and help this program out. So I'm gonna be speaking tonight uh, uh, based on this book that I published a couple of years ago, um, based on work that I've done, I did first with um, uh, many years ago with a fellow named Alvin Holm, an architect named Alvin Holm, who uh, taught me the orders, uh, taught me to draw the orders in New York under uh, the auspices of Henry Reed from Classical America the precursor group to the ICA. And, uh, and then I had the privilege of studying with this fellow Keith Critchlow uh, over in England. And uh, he was, um, uh, he's an architect and a scholar, uh, architect painter and scholar. And he, um, he took me through the works of Plato uh, and showed me the comparison or allowed me to make the comparison between the classical system that I studied with Alvin Holm. and size small. Uh, you want with the works of Plato. So uh, that's what this book is based on. And that's what my work has been based on. So let's see if I can advance this here. I think it's this or is it this one? Nope, not going to advance. Uh, there we go. Okay, we can advance that way. Um, <clears throat> so proportion, it has a technical mathematical definition, but it's... Uh, in, in design, it's the use of number and geometry as tools for design or for creating character, really. Um, and what I mean by number and geometry is illustrated in this uh, in these images from uh, Vitruvius. I don't know, can you see the cursor? Can people see the cursor? Is that being shown? All right, well, hope it's being shown. Um, the um, You can use the use of number in terms of um, arithmetic, uh, this is a, um, uh, is illustrated in uh, Vitruvius, who is the, an ancient uh, Roman writer, the only book that we have from the ancient world specifically on architecture, and has been very influential over the last 500 years or so. Um, 
And he uses what you might call an arithmetic system of division. So he takes the width of a portico and he divides it into a certain number of parts, uh, depending on how many columns there are and what type of spacing you want to use and a number of other factors. Um, so what I did was I recreated or redrew following his directions as, as, as closely as I could, uh, his directions for a certain type of portico. Uh, and he divides it into 11 and a half parts, he divides the width into 11 and a half parts. Now you would say, well, where does he get a number like that from? A modern person reading that just thinks that this is completely arbitrary um, and it can't have any basis. And people have said that in writing over the years, <clears throat> that this just doesn't have any basis. Um, other than his whim or, or whatever. But um, but then if you do the, if you take what he's uh, instructed you to do and you put a geometrical analysis over it, you find that first of all, the portico fits in a square. And second, that the square can be divided at its uh, golden section point. Now we'll talk more about the golden section in a little while. Uh, and then that, that point gives you the location of the column. And it also gives you, by a certain other manipulation, it gives you the height of the column. So this is what I mean by geometry. So behind the arithmetic is a geometry uh, in the Vitruvius. And uh, so let's see, all right, I'm gonna to try to advance again. Um, in the arts, number and geometry are not approached in the conventional sense uh, of mathematics. Uh, mathematics is a technical subject and it's strictly logical. And every problem has a correct answer and an indefinite number of incorrect answers. But in the arts, uh, there are an indefinite number of answers and all of them could have some degree of correctness. So number has to be approached, if it's gonna be helpful, it has to be approached in a philosophical or qualitative or symbolic form. I like the symbolic idea, uh, where number is a symbol. Now in the ancient world, number as symbol is associated with the uh, philosophy of the Pythagoreans. And so I've got a couple of images here of uh, Pythagoreans. Here they are kind of worshiping the sun. Uh, but um, this illustration down here from a, a 20th century book, uh, kind of fanciful image, but it, it gives you the, um, the uh, numerical and geometrical attributes uh, of the classical system. And it, it alludes to arithmetic up here in this um, triangular array of 10 dots known as the tetractus. Uh, and, it, uh, and we have geometry here in the 47th problem of Euclid and here in the solid geometry, this is two dimensional, this is three dimensional geometry. Music is down here, we have a lyre, we have a book and we have some kind of diagram, I'm not sure what that diagram is. But, uh, and then with the fourth subject is astronomy and we have that alluded to here um, by the uh, the globe. And these are uh, Pythagorean attributes. Uh, I'm going to see if I can. There we go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now this, this view, well, let me go back actually. Let me see if I can go back. Yeah, there we go. Um, the, the idea of using number and geometry is to create a character. It's, you're not trying to get a right answer because they're in, in the arts, there are no absolutely right answers. There's just an answer and you have to evaluate it. Um, the number in geometry is used to create a harmony between the parts and between the parts and the whole that gives a, a sense of unity to the work. And this is, is a major uh, idea. Uh, it was called Eurythmy by Vitruvius, meaning good movement. And it was called Consinitas by Alberti, meaning that everything has to act together. All the parts of the design have to act together. Right. Now, this kind of approach only makes sense uh, in a cosmos that's cre that comprises a single entity. And uh, Plato tells us uh, in the Timaeus that the cosmos is a, a, a single entity endowed with life and intelligence, that the universe itself has these properties uh, given to it by its creator. This is a diagram that I've abstracted from works like the Timaeus and the Republic about the nature of the psyche of the world soul. Um, the outer, there's an outer circle that provides the containment of the psyche of the world soul. Um, within that world soul, this upper, this upper circle and this lower circle um, 
withdraw. How, how can I say it? It, it, it? You start out as the circle of psyche and this upper circle withdraws upwards and the lower circle starts as the circle of psyche and withdraws downward. Um, and these are in turn united and stabilized by the individual psyche, the individual soul. <clears throat> and the soul is not a moral entity in, in Plato. It's a practical entity. It's a kind of has a, a function. It's a functional entity, I should say. Uh, and it, and we, one, one reaches up through the imagination and, and down through the senses. It, the, this upper circle is what's called nous or, or form, idea, without matter. And the lower circle is called yule, which is matter without form or idea. And the psyche, as I say, looks up to the nous through the imagination and impresses that, um, that form into matter through the use of, of the senses, through, through physicality. Um, so this is the cosmos. Uh, that you need to imagine uh, to make proportion have any meaning or sense or any reason to, to, uh, to use it. Um, now, the coming into being of such a universe can be thought of in four stages. Uh, we have uh, unity represented by the circle and the point, and the point is a mysterious entity uh, because it has, it's set to, it's defined as having location without dimension. So if something has no dimension, it really can't be fully in the world, not fully in the world with us. So where is it, one might ask? It's in a metaphysical dimension somewhere. But yet the point is the basis for the spatial constructions that, that are going to come from it. So the cosmos in the ancient view always begins in a mystery and is a mystery and will remain a mystery, basically. Um, then you have the, 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 so the first is unity. Second stage is, is a division. The, the unity divides within itself. It doesn't add another unity. So there's only one universe. It's not, uh, in the, it doesn't use the modern physics concepts of multiple universes. That's a theory, uh, which I don't know will ever be substantiated, but uh, the ancient view is that there's one universe and everything takes place within that one universe. In fact, if you if you presume multiple universes, you're only putting off the issue. You're not solving the issue really. But anyway, um, we have these two circles. The upper circle has started as the as the soul, as psyche and is withdrawn upwards, and the lower circle has withdrawn downwards. And we stopped them at the center point. So uh, we have the dyad. Now the dyad is an unstable entity. You can see here it has the form in this diagram. It has the form of the tai chi. And the Tai Chi are a dynamic pair uh, that are constantly in motion and they're constantly changing. So the dyad is what's called the indefinite dyad or the unstable dyad. It's constantly changing. So in order to stabilize it, you have to go to a third element. You have to go to a triadic structure or you might say a Trinitarian structure. Uh, and, and so now we have a stable universe, but we're still not fully materialized. And so you have to have a fourth stage uh, which is the the square? The, the, I call it the tetrad here, or it could be the cube. It's you know, the cube was the Earth um, form uh, in ancient times. So you go through stages of uh, if you want to take them. Well, you go through the stages of unity, division, structure, and manifestation. Those are the four steps, or we can be thought of in four steps. It also can be thought of geometrically as point, line, plane, and solid. So you go from the mystery into full. Uh, manifestation. These are also, these stages can also be likened to the four mathematical subjects that we talked about in the previous slide. Arithmetic, which is number and concept. Geometry, which is number and space. Music, which is number and time. And astronomy, which is number and space and time. And we also have to think of the idea of the cycle. There is in, in the Platonic universe, there is a cosmogenic cycle. Um, um, the cosmos is said to have been created because its creator was good and wanted every possible entity that could ever exist to experience that goodness. And so time and space came into being to facilitate that process. So the cosmos in this view proceeds from the good. It maintains in the true. Um, and this was in many cases, there are many names for this. Um, in, uh, in the 18th century, this was called natural law. 
In ancient Egypt, it was called Mat. In India, it was called Dharma. And in China, it was called the Tao, or the Way. Uh, but this is how the universe maintains itself. But anything that comes into being has to return to being, uh, to that being, that state of being. And so there's going to be a return. And the return is symbolized by the beautiful, the idea of beauty. And we'll talk a little more about this as we go on. Um, what I've done here is I've placed the three principal orders of architecture, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, relating to the, uh, the good, the true, and the beautiful, so to speak, or the proceeding, maintaining, and returning. Uh, the Doric order symbolizes the coming forth or the, the budding here. Whoops, excuse me, I'm going to go back. It's the wrong thing. Um, the, the budding of the capital symbolizes the coming forth into the good or from the good. The scrolls of the Ionic represent the unfolding of the truth uh, of the way. And the, uh, the leaves and volutes of the Corinthian represent the returning system. Uh, if you, each of these orders has a myth of origin. And uh, in the myth of origin of the Corinthian order, it's based on um, the reincarnation um, through nature. It's based on a kind of reincarnation through nature. And what you're seeing here is actually a figure known as the Maiden of Corinth reincarnated as nature or through nature. Um, and so this is associated with the beautiful. Let's see where we're going here. Okay, so the goal, I want to talk a little more about beauty specifically, that the work, uh, the idea of uh, work in any classical method or any clown search, just any classical art form, whether it's visual or performing, or whether it's music, whether it's dance, uh, whether it's painting or sculpture or architecture, whether it's even literature or poetry. Um, the goal of any working in a classical mode is to achieve the possibility that the observer will experience or the listener, or the, the participant will experience beauty. And beauty is defined in this system uh, by Plotinus here in the third century. Uh, it looks like a pretty severe character. I don't know. I don't know, but he uh, he was a very important philosopher in the early third century in Rome. And he, in part of his writings, he talks about beauty as the joyous state of the soul as it recalls its relation to divine unity. So in other words, the, um, the soul in this system is said to descend from that outer circle to the inner circle, from the outer circle of the world soul, it descends and, and forms itself into the individual psyche. But in so doing, Plato says, the soul forgets where it came from or forgets what it was originally and identifies with the body. So the work of the life of the person is to remember where one came from. And the experience of beauty is the joy that one experiences when you remember where you came from. You remember that you are part of that great unity, of that great mysterious unity. And there's, a, there's an upliftment that comes from that. That's a kind of joyous state. Um, but now this definition implies certain aspects. So that the beauty is not in the thing. It's not in the object, nor is it in the measure of the object. That may sound strange because I'm talking about proportions here, but um, but beauty is not in things that measure things. It's a metaphysical state. It's in you. It's a metaphysical state of the soul. The beauty is in you and it's in the observer. Uh, it's not in the object. And, the, and so it's an experience. It's not a fact. It's an experience. It, it, it can't be given away or forced on anyone. And it can only be experienced depending on the preparation of the person. So as artists or creative people, we would study these things. but just as an observer of them, uh, you, you need to be prepared. And we'll talk a little more about that in the next slide, um, what, what I mean by preparation. Um, the other thing that's important for artists to remember about this concept of beauty is that the experience of beauty produces desire. It produces eros, the child of Aphrodite. Um, the, the, the desire to join with that object of beauty, it produces a desire. So for the artist, for the creative person, this is the way 
to, as you might say, make people want it or to make people attracted to your work or to attract people to your work is by giving them this uplifting, joyous experience. And, and again, the tool for that is proportion, uh, number and geometry. So I just want to mention this idea of ascension. Um, uh, here, here again is this image of the tetractus. It's 10 dots arranged in an equilateral triangle. <clears throat> and it's a very useful metaphor. Uh, level four is the, uh, these are the four steps of that ontological diagram, right? You have unity, division, structure, and manifestation. Um, it's just a different way of expressing them. So we start down here. We start our work in the world down here in the physical world, and we appreciate the beauty of bodies. And this is specifically, you appreciate the physical beauty of one's lover or one's lovers. Um, but if you're working on upliftment, you begin to realize that those people that you that your lover has more in common with the rest of the human race than they have difference. That's true for all of us. We all have more in common than we have differences, although it can be hard to recognize. And so then you get drawn up to the beauty of ideas, the beauty of those ideas that unite everybody behind the scenes, so to speak. Beyond the, the beauty of ideas is the beauty of action, the beauty of choice, the beauty of virtue, of choosing the good. Uh, and beyond that, even is what is called what he calls transcendent beauty, which is just beauty itself, the experience of beauty itself, not embodied in any way or attached to any human body or any human idea or any human action. Uh, it's just pure, pure beauty, as it were, noose, the noose of beauty. And this is what's called Diotima's ladder. Diotima was, um, a, a, we don't know if she was a real person or not, but Socrates. Uh, in this in this diagram in this dialogue called the symposium, quotes her as uh, one of his teachers uh, on this subject of how one aspires upwards uh, in the in the search for beauty. So, in the end, it's important to remember the artist is married to beauty, and here's the literal marriage. This is Hephaestus, who's the divinity, the, the Olympian divinity. Of, of artisanship or craftsmanship. And here we see him making armor for one of the Trojan heroes. He is married to Aphrodite, the goddess of physical love and beauty. Now her task is to make love and to induce others to make love. But she, in effect, is so busy doing this that she doesn't, the one person she doesn't make love to is, of course, her husband. Um, now Hephaestus is the least attractive of all the divinities. And this is an arranged marriage. I, I, this story is a wonderful story, but it's too long to go into here. But it's an arranged marriage, so to speak. And they're opposite characters. Um, he's a very hardworking guy. He's physically the least attractive of the Olympians. He works in the shop down here. He's, he's hot. He's sweaty. He also is crippled. And you can't tell from this image. But he, um, he actually needs crutches uh, to get around. And he builds himself a uh, wheelchair, actually a self-propelling wheelchair in the myth uh, of, of his uh, existence. So uh, he becomes frustrated with her and he, um, he induces her to meet with her regular boyfriend who is Ares, the war god. Now in, in actual astronomy, uh, Mars, Mars here and Venus meet in the sky about once every 13 months in their cycles. Uh, and so Mars and Venus have this relationship in the myth that they have in the physical um, astronomical world. Well, Hephaestus gets frustrated with this and he lures them together and he throws a net over them and he calls the other divinities as, as proof that he's uh, being uh, not, uh, he's uh, yeah, proof of his problem, so to speak. Well, they're all hysterical laughing because they all understand what's going on. He was the only one who didn't know. So in the end, he's the one who's demeaned. Uh, and the, the lesson is you can't get frustrated. The, the artist is bound to seek beauty, <clears throat> but beauty doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to everybody. It's not something you can claim to own. Um, and according to Alberti, the search for beauty will take everything you have and more, and even then, it's only going to be rarely achieved. 
So the end lesson here is you have to seek beauty, but don't get frustrated. I would say just keep working. And some people will get closer than others. You don't know. Let others be the, the judge. So that's the first part of the uh, book that I published, which is a kind of a theory, a, a neoplatonic theory or a platonic theory of aesthetics, how you could make an aesthetic uh, out of Plato's ideas. The second part of the book is a kind of workbook. It's a practical workbook about how to actually apply the ideas of proportion uh, in one's actual design work. So basically, there are three methods. Two of them we've already seen. Um, the arithmetic method by Vitru of Vitruvius, and behind that or underneath that is a geometric method. Now, the geometric method will keep you close to unity, and it'll harmonically relate all the parts for you almost automatically. But it can be difficult to communicate or apply in practical situations. It can be difficult. It's very difficult to lay out geometry in the field in an actual building site. It's almost impossible as a rule. Um, and also you would need to teach people how to do these constructions, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, and also in ancient times, we have to remember that many of these geometrical constructions were part of initiatic traditions that were secret. They were, in, they were done in private and transmitted in private, and you were not supposed to communicate them. If you knew them, you weren't supposed to communicate them to anyone else. And uh, there are many famous mystery uh, uh, experiences such as the Eleusinian mysteries uh, where we don't actually know exactly what went on, but we know that geometry was part of the teaching in some way, part of the secrets that were revealed to the initiate, uh, which they were not allowed to reveal to others, the non-initiates. So here we see the geometry. Um, and if we take an archetypal order like this, which has a pedestal, a column, and an entablature, um, if we divide the overall height by this figure of phi or the golden section, which we'll talk about uh, again in, in a little bit, um, that gives you the interval of the column. And further, ge further harmonic subdivisions give you the other elements. And that's just pure geometry. You can also arithmetically divide the order into 19 parts. <clears throat> this is uh, very symbolic. We'll see later on that the ancient Egyptians had a canon of 19. Um, and you can see that the, if you go 4, 12, and 3, it gives you this almost exactly the same uh, pattern. And here, I'm, what I'm doing here is just actually doing the arithmetic and showing you how close we're going to come. Because whenever you work, whenever you take a, um, a geometrical relationship like this and you try to put it into arithmetic, there's always going to be a, uh, a distortion. There's always going to be something that's a little bit off um, because you can't do it perfectly. It's part of the nature of these things. So we know that these two things existed in the ancient world. And for my, for my money, I think the geometric system came first and the arithmetic system was a rationalization because it's easy to communicate, but it's also easy to lose sight of unity when you get into the minutia of all the little dimensions. Um, it probably always existed, but it, in the Renaissance, it, it comes to the fore, uh, a, a, a kind of a middle ground between the arithmetic and the geometric that I refer to as a harmonic ratio method. And we see it here, um, where you take the height of the order and you divide it into five parts and you strike off the lower fifth for the pedestal, take the remaining interval, the remaining four parts, divide them into five and strike off one part for the entablature. So that's what I mean by the harmonic ratio method. And this, uh, you can see it, uh, it begins in the Renaissance and it comes to fruition with Palladio in the 16th century um, with his pr uh, basic proportions for rooms or the, his the most approved proportions for rooms. So I think we're through with that. So there are two kinds of ratios involved uh, in proportional work. The first are what they call rational ratios. That is to say, uh, ratios made out of whole numbers. And these are generally related to the, to the musical system, to the musical octave. Uh, this is a diagram that comes from Claudius Ptolemy, uh, who was in, uh, from Alexandria. And we see he was famous for his, uh, well, he wrote on all of the four subjects, right? He wrote on arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. 
Uh, the astronomy was very famous and uh, determined people's thinking for quite a few centuries after his time. I think he lived in the, I don't know, it's the second century BC or the first century BC. I'm not sure. Um, but this diagram is called the Helicon, uh, named after Mount Helicon, which I think is a reference to this shape here, uh, where Apollo governs the muses that are the, the musical divinities. Uh, and it's a way of getting the lengths of strings for the four principal chords of the octave. Uh, now, today, this would be what we call C major, right? So, and, and we're descending in tone. So if we start with the length of a string, a given string, it resonates at a certain tone. If we pluck it, it resonates at a certain tone. And that's referred to as the fundamental. If we double the length of that string, we produce a tone one octave lower. And the two intermediate tones are the fifth note and the fourth note. The fifth note is one and a half times the fundamental. And the fourth note is one and a third times the fundamental. And these two intervals are given by this geometrical construction. The intersections of the diagonal and this figure called the semi-diagonal, right? Uh, this intersection divides the side of the square into three parts. So here you have three thirds plus one third, you get the four thirds. And here the semi-diagonal divides the center of the square here into these two parts. And so we have, um, we have one half, two halves, and three halves. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the four ratios, the f what you call rational ratios. And in the work that I did over the years, I was able to construct porticos following canonical rules that are based on, on, on this geometry and others as well. But this is a musical, so this is the musical analogy, so to speak, um, between music and architecture. Uh, and I'm just using the same geometrical diagram that's giving me the center of the column, that's giving me the height of the column, <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's giving me actually it's giving me actually the width of the column. If you take the interval between here and here, that's the width of the column. And if I take the half square then uh, and divide that, we get the height of the entablature. So all of the key parts of the order are given by um, this musical diagram. So this is what I mean by the musical analogy. And this was a very important aspect of the proportional. Um, aspect of, class, of uh, classical design. Now, again, if, um, if the whole and the part are created on the same geometrical network or a very similar geometrical network, you get a sense of unity. Um, and, and, it, and here you see the, uh, the, the diagonals and the semi-diagonals are giving you, again, the column height and position, but it's also giving you the key point in the uh, creation of the capital itself. It doesn't necessarily imply the form of the capital, but it does give you the ratios. Um, and so the whole and the part are created on a similar method. So this is something to strive for. This is a kind of ideal situation, um, but it is something to strive for. Then there are what are called transrational, what I call transrational ratios. And that is to say ratios based on geometry rather than arithmetic. They're not related by whole numbers. They can only be, uh, in the ancient world anyway, they can only be described geometrically. And we start with the same ontological ideas as we saw in the first uh, story. So we start with the, uh, the circle of unity, the circle of theos, and we have an upper circle that withdraws and a lower circle that withdraws. But here we stop them at a different place. In the previous diagram, we stopped them at the center where they met at the center tangent. But here we're gonna stop them at a place where the center of one is on the circumference of the other. And this is a particular figure called the vesicle Pisces. And this figure played a role in early Christianity, the symbolism of early Christianity. Um, so it's very interesting from that point of view. Um, and the vesicle Pisces means vessel of the fish. And we think about it as a lot of uh, aquatic or fish imagery in uh, the story of Jesus. Um, so this symbol, this became a symbol in the early years. 
Uh, it, this figure has a number of remarkable geometrical properties. If the short axis is one, the long axis is equal to the square root of three. And we can construct an equilateral triangle in it. Now, if we continue to rotate the, this radius and this radius away along these uh, circumferences, we can actually create any regular polygon up, and an indefinite number of polygons, um, regular polygons. And here, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm rotating those two. Uh, radii until they're parallel with each other uh, and with the center and you get a square and if the square side is one the diagonal of the square is equal to the square root of two if you double the square as we do here you get one you get a shape that's one to the square root of four which is two now that's a whole number and i included in here because it demonstrates that this transrational system is not completely separate from the rational system. They're actually one system and they weave in and out of each other. They weave from transrational to whole numbers to transrational numbers and whole numbers. And you can keep going with this for a long time. Um, we don't need to go very far with it. The diagonal of the double square is equal to the square root of five. So you got the square root of two, square root of three, You've got the double square and then the square root of five. Through a manipulation of that diagonal, if we take half of that diagonal and we apply it onto the vertical axis, we get this interval, which is equal to 0 0.618. And this is, it's, it's denominated by the Greek letter F for phi. So it's called phi in the modern, uh, in the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> and it's 0.618. And what I'm doing in this diagram here is I'm showing that if you construct a rectangle using that interval, using one and phi, that rectangle returns you to the circle of unity. And it accomplishes what I think is the, the major significance of the golden section, which is that it returns you to unity through multiplicity. So here we have, we started out with mysterious unity and we did all these divisions uh, into the multiplicity, and then we return to unity. This is the big project in, in the classical mind, I think, is the return to unity. What you're doing in this life is working on that return, and you're doing it through the elevation of consciousness, which is partly accomplished through the experience of beauty, which we saw in Diotima's Ladder. Um, so... Right. So many people, there's been a lot of ink spilled about the golden ratio, the golden section. Um, many people argue, or it's been argued, that this is the most beautiful rectangle or the most beautiful ratio. Uh, I actually don't agree. I don't think the golden ratio or this ratio here, this rectangle here, is any more beautiful than any other rectangle. Why? Because the beauty is not in the rectangle. <laughs> right? So these guys missed the point. I mean, there are people who did, in the 19th century, they did these statistical studies of showing people rectangles and statistically scoring them and so on. And you can, I, I mean, it's, you can prove anything you want that way, basically. And so some people came to the conclusion that the golden section was the most beautiful rectangle. Other people came to the conclusion that it wasn't. Now, I actually take the second position, but for different reasons than the ones they took. Anyway. The, the, the importance of the golden section is symbolic. Again, it's where you're in the realm of symbols here. It symbolizes the return to unity through multiplicity. It also has a very particular arithmetic, um, which is very helpful in creating that sense of unity. Right? Now, it can also be created starting with a square. And the diagonal of that square is equal to the square root of two. <clears throat> so if it's applied, onto an extension of the base of the square, you get what's called a root two rectangle. That's one to the square root of two. The diagonal of a root two rectangle applied gives you the square root of three, which is kind of remarkable. And that gives the, the, the diagonal of that rectangle gives you a double square, even more remarkable. <laughs> and we can go on. Uh, and it, the, the, the diagonal of the double square, as we've seen, gives you the square root of five. You can get to the golden section 
by starting with a root five rectangle and subtracting unity from it and then dividing the remainder in half. So this is what's called a, uh, it's called geometrical algebra basically. Uh, how you, you work with these algebraic, with things that we would today do with algebra can only be done in ancient times through geometry. Because it was very hard for them. They, they, they didn't have this kind of symbolism, like the square root of five. They, they really didn't have that. They, uh, uh, they, they had to visualize everything directly for various reasons. But this is a modern phenomenon. So we tend to think algebraically. In the ancient world, they didn't have algebra yet. So they thought geometrically. So geometry was much, actually much more important in the ancient world than it is today. Now, phi or the golden section can be expanded outward or contracted inward. If you expand outward, then phi is equal to 1.618. If you divide inwardly, then phi is equal to 0.618. So the golden section can be either of these two figures. In my own work, I tend to use 0.618, the, the, the lesser division or the internal division, because what I'm doing, if, I, if, I, if we can design things by putting them in a square, starting with a square and finding things like the golden section point. And there are other points as well that we could find, but or many others. But um, this is, the, I think, the key one uh, is the, uh, the golden section point. And it creates the golden section, and then it creates a harmonically related leftover which actually technically is this number squared, right? So this is part of the golden section. Now the golden section, we can go further and create a phi, what you call a phi scale or golden section scale. a series of related intervals that are all harmonically related to the golden section. And, uh, and by repeating the pattern, what we create here, this was the golden section point. So we create a similar triangle and repeat the move with the compass point here and you swing the arc down to here then you position the compass here and you swing the arc up to the side and you'll get uh, again a series of harmonically related phi intervals uh, and you can keep going with this as far as your instruments can go and you can use these intervals either to shape portions of the design elements of the design and you can position elements uh, in, in places related to these uh, intervals. And this is true of the golden section and other ratios as well. Now, one other very important point about the golden section, and again, what, one of the reasons for its importance, and it's just, it's the thing that won't go away. The golden section, whenever people turn to the classical, at some point, they find the golden section because it's always there. Um, it's almost ubiquitous and many natural forms, organic unities, use five proportions uh, to govern themselves and to grow. This includes the human being. Um, and this, fam this diagram is so famous that it's become a cliche, but it's very important. It starts with Vitruvius. Vitruvius describes this idea that the human being um, with the center at the navel can form a circle or with the center at the groin can form a square. And these two figures are related through the golden section because the navel of the human being is at the phi point of the height of the human being. Now in ancient times, this would have been called a hieros gamos or a sacred marriage of matter and spirit, which gives life to otherwise inanimate matter. What, what is the physical body? What is our physical body? It's, in a, it's, it's just made out of stuff. It's stuff, right? But yet we're alive and we're conscious and we can converse. Uh, and so there's a, again, there's a mystery there, right? How does life get endowed? Well, it gets endowed. Well, I don't know how it gets endowed, but let's, let's say that there's the, the outward aspect of how it gets endowed is in these proportions, is in this golden section. So the golden section squares the circle and the arithmetic is down here. It comes within 3% of squaring the circle. Okay. Um, so this is the key. This is the golden section is a way of putting life or reminding people of organic life 
And again, reminding, because organic life is a unity. Life can only manifest in unity in some way. Uh, it, it can't, it doesn't manifest in division or, or, or other aspects. It, it manifests in unity. So if you can create a sense of unity, you can create, you can allow for the experience of beauty and the upliftment that's involved. So this is the importance of this figure. It's actually a very important figure. Uh, it's so, again, it's so important that the modern world had to denigrate it in effect, because it's very important. Okay, so I was able in my own work again to use these principles to construct uh, porticos that comply with the traditional rules of a traditional, uh, not rules, they're uh, guides uh, in, the, in the classic uh, reference books, such as uh, Palladio or Vignola or Alberti or uh, Chambers or any of these Gibbs, any of these people. Um, and so here are the steps up here. We start with a square. We find the five point, construct a circle. And the key that you hit it right is in the little ears that stick out. <laughs> uh, it's not a, the, the corners are not inside the circle, they're just outside. Um, and, and then you take that circle <clears throat> and you divide it into five parts and draw the diagonals. And the intersections of the diagonals will give you everything you need for the portico. The, the top diagonal gives you the height of the columns. And this, uh, one of these vertical diagonals gives you the two points that mark the position and the diameter of the column. Um, and then a, uh, another application of the same pattern of division gives you the members of the entablature. And it can even give you the um, the Corinthian column, also constructed on the pentagram. This is all gone into in the book. And so this is a section that consists of a series of exercises. And where this leads is that for me, the classical elements have what I call a deep anthropomorphism. Um, they, they, there's a resonance with the human being that I've sort of been talking at for the last few minutes. And it's summed up for me in this diagram, uh, which I really enjoy. Uh, it juxtaposes a figure from ancient Egypt, maybe 4,000 year old figure or 3,500 year old figure uh, divided into 19 parts. And this diagram from William R. Ware's American Vignola, um, Ware was anything but a mystic. Uh, he was a pillar of society. He um, created the schools of architecture, I believe at MIT, one of the first schools in the country and later at Columbia University. And he publishes this diagram of the division of the classical order into 19 parts. Um, I notice here, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things about these diagrams, I, we don't have time to go into it. But the 18th part, it comes up to what is called the third eye in, in India. Um, and he, the figure is wearing this serpent crown called the Uraeus. And the, the shape of the crown is the shape of the Sima recta molding that is traditionally put at the top of the building. And we can see it here in these uh, Di Giorgio drawings, uh, where again, this is the deep anthropomorphism, where everything in the building reminds you in a deep way, not in a superficial way, but in a deep way um, of living entities. And this gives it the sense of unity and allows for the experience of the beautiful. So, the, so this was a, a great system. Um, and you had to ask what happened because we don't, obviously we don't have it anymore. Part of the work I think that Paul is doing um, at, at the school there is to re, uh, reinvigorate the system. I know that has been the project at ICA. It was the project at Notre Dame under uh, uh, Thomas Gordon Smith, the wonderful figure, uh, sadly passed away recently, but, um, um, but it's to reinstall those ideas. So, but you have to ask what happened. So the third section of my book is about what happened or is about my view in effect of what happened. Uh, and I'll just touch on a couple of high points here. Uh, one of the, the major figures involved um, in the destruction of the old system is this fellow Claude Perrault. Now Claude Perrault worked for the king and the king at that point was involved in a struggle with the church uh, with the Catholic Church over mostly who was going to collect taxes, right? Because to have a modern state, you have to have an army, a regrettable a reality. 
And in order to have an army, you have to pay them. And in order to pay them, you have to have a secure tax flow. And the church had hitherto traditionally collected taxes in kind. They didn't, they, nobody had money in the Middle Ages. So the church collected um, uh, grain or, or animals or uh, other uh, quantities, physical stuff that they bartered for. Uh, and so the kings had to uh, retake control of that financial system. And Perot was one of the people who worked for the king uh, and, and was, um, his role was to bring aesthetics into that nationalistic secular realm. And what he does, he, he attacks the classical system at least in three ways. There's probably other, there's probably more to it as well. But <clears throat> the three the three principal strikes that he gives are that he splits beauty into inherent and customary. Right? So he says, well, music has an inherent beauty because you have to get the tones correct in order for them to harmonize. Otherwise, you'll hear dissonance and it won't it, it can't be beautiful. Um, dissonance is the opposite of beauty, basically. Um, Whereas architecture, um, there were an indefinite number of Doric capitals, for example. Um, so if you measured, if you went to various buildings and you measured various Doric capitals, you'd find every building is, is a different, slightly different proportion um, or, or ratios or, or measures. And so he says, well, given that fact, then architectural beauty can only be customary. That is to say, we only think it's beautiful because we're used to it. So therefore, beauty does not have beauty in architecture and in the art, the fine arts, does not have an objective quality. This is the key, right? If you go by Plotinus, there's an objective aspect. Beauty is the memory of unity, right? That's why the book is called Beauty, Memory, Unity. Um, but in Perot, Perot says, no, we're going to just look at the physical stuff. That's not the way it is, right? There's an errant, there's things that are beautiful by themselves. And there's things that, that are just beautiful because we're used to them. So he severs beauty from architecture, or he severs architecture from beauty. Then he points out quite correctly, again, from a physical standpoint, from that level four, right, that physical materiality standpoint, that the eye and the ear work differently. Well, they do, they do. Um, thereby destroying the musical analogy. But of course they worked it, but, you can only do that if you're only going to discuss the physical, right? So this is the key to this idea of the enlightenment is that we're only going to discuss the physical. We're not going to discuss the metaphysical. We're just going to, we're going to push that off the table, right? We're not even, we're not even going to discuss it. Okay. Only the physical, we're only going to discuss the physical. And his third strike is that since we never see things exactly orthographically that therefore these ratios, these carefully controlled ratios, can't play any role in aesthetics. And this is an attitude that's continued right to the present day in modernism, modernist architecture. You will find these three uh, qualities um, that proportion can play no role in aesthetics, in effect. But of course, in the ancient world, it was the basis of aesthetics. All right. The second shoe, so to speak, drops about a hundred years later with this fellow Edmund Burke, very interesting character. Um, he was a leading parliamentarian in England in the 18th century. And he was also, I believe, the Grand Master of Freemasons in his time. And um, uh, he also wrote a, uh, he wrote a report for uh, the parliament on why Britain lost the American Revolution, which I haven't read. I would love to read it someday. It must be a fascinating thing. Uh, anyway, he, he publishes a, a book, um, uh, not a book, it's an essay, really, a long essay about the difference between the sublime and the beautiful. And his goal is to replace the beautiful with the sublime. He won't talk about the nature of beauty. It's really fascinating. He just says, no, no, we're not going to discuss it. It's too complicated. We're not going to, literally, he says, it's too complicated. We're not going to discuss it. Well, he doesn't want, it's obvious why he doesn't want to. He wants to replace it with the sublime. Now, what is this sublime? The sublime is the idea that <clears throat> um, if you're, let's say you're out in the woods and you're being chased by a bear, well, you're in danger and you feel fear. You feel an emotional reaction of fear uh, uh, from that actual situation and you're in danger. But he points out that if you can 
create that situation where the person is not actually in danger, then it becomes a kind of entertainment and it becomes a kind of focus for the mind. You can control people's reactions and you can get them to emotionally react the way you want them to react. So the sublime occurs when, when the mind is stunned and the faculties uh, fail to work uh, with, in the face of something incomprehensible like the night sky. Uh, where it's just there's a million stars and you can't count them and where are they and what are they and stuff. You got to remember, nobody knew that until the 19th century. Nobody knew what the stars actually were. Um, and there were a million theories, right? But this idea of something that's incomprehensible, that you can't communicate, it's too much to communicate. Um, things that appear to be infinite, that are scaleless, right? Think about modern architecture in terms of scalelessness. Um, and it's something when, when you encounter them that you can't relate to. And so you surrender and only this fear of annihilation remains, but you're not actually in any danger. The night sky can't hurt you, but you just feel kind of terrified uh, or, or like you're, you know, I must be nothing, right? And people react to this like, uh, what am I? I mean, I'm a dust mode on a dust mode. I mean, really, right? And this is the experience of the sublime. Uh, this is the beginning of what is called romanticism in the arts. So the sublime, he tells us, is hard, angular, and dark, and the beautiful is soft and gently curved and light. Well, a couple of generations after him, in the Romantic era now, comes this woman, Mary Shelley, married to the poet Percy, the Romantic poet Percy Shelley, and she creates Frankenstein. Well, think about Frankenstein for a minute. Um, He's incomprehensible. What is he thinking? We don't know. He's incommunicable. He just grunts. Ah, ah, right? That's all he can do. Um, he's scaleless. He's out of scale. He's too big, right? Uh, look at the sleeves. You know, he's he's too big, man. He's the wrong size and stuff. And so you're terrified. When you see this figure, you're terrified. He's hard. His head is hard. He's got, a, in the movies, they put a bolt through his head. That would Mary Shelley didn't do that, but uh, he's hard and angular, he's dark, he's dressed in black, right? Think about all this. So what I'm going to propose, or what I propose in the book, is that what we have today is a kind of Frankenstein aesthetic. Right? The modern era is the, an aesthetic of Frankenstein. Rather than an aesthetic of beauty, it's an aesthetic of terror, uh, of fear, uh, and inspires anxiety. Another way to look at the modern world is through Goethe, who's a very interesting figure. And he, he writes, I don't know if he was the original author of this, but I know he, he, he did a written version of what today we call The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And it was the subject of this uh, Disney piece, God help us, um, um, where the story is basically that there's a sorcerer who has an apprentice here, Mickey, and, uh, and the sorcerer has to go out on some errands and he asks the apprentice to mop the floor of the, the workshop. But the apprentice has seen him uh, vitalize matter, cast a spell to vitalize matter. So he vitalizes the mop to get the mop to do the mopping by itself without him. Uh, but he realizes after the, the mop is finished and it keeps mopping, he realizes that he doesn't know how to get it to stop. And so he kind of panics and he chops up the mop with an ax. And but because he's vitalized the, 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 the mop, every part of the mop becomes another mop. It's alive. And so here we see an army of mops about to run him over and drown him. And of course, the sorcerer comes back and, um, and puts it to a stop, puts a stop to it. But you think of the modern world, you think of the world that we've created, this post-enlightenment world, where we can turn the powers of nature on, but we can't turn them off. And these two places are the symbol of that. Right, you know, Fukushima has irradiated the entire Pacific Ocean. It, 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 nobody wants to talk about this kind of thing because it's really grim and tragic. But the entire Pacific Ocean has been irradiated. Chernobyl, I mean, they just had another war. <laughs> it just was another military action around this place that contaminated a, a chunk of Europe, like 20% of Europe was contaminated by this thing. And they're still fighting. I mean, this fighting hasn't stopped. Anyway. The modern world is like the Sorcerer's Apprentice world. 
And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. So you turn the powers of nature on, they're going to come and get you if you don't, if you can't turn them off. So how do we escape? And how do we return? How do we go from alienation, anxiety, terror, and ugliness back to something that's harmonic, that's centered, that's positive, that's beautiful? Well, there could be many ways. And here we see the, the sorcerer uh, and, and his, the apprentice in an apologetic mode. You know, they even put the mop in. Um, now, no longer animated. Uh, so for me, there have been, I can only talk personally, really. I think that there could be many, many ways that we can escape from this um, or return to something more positive. I was able to study the Platonic system uh, with this fellow Critchlow. Uh, it was very, um, it was a, a very unique opportunity uh, that changed my whole uh, situation. One of the things he taught was how to voluntarily assume the ancient harmonic viewpoint without denying the modern mechanistic viewpoint, right? So yes, the, the earth goes around the sun, but in fact, what we experience is the sun going around us, right? And both of those things can be true at the same time. And if we're gonna escape, from imprisonment in this modern alienation, we're gonna to have to assume things like that. We're gonna to have to be able to be on both sides of that fence. You can study Goethe. I've tried to study Goethe on my own. You need a teacher. He's very obscure to the modern world because we've been trained in a different way of thinking. He was the last non-reductionist scientist in Europe. He got laughed at, uh, but there were still people trying to work with his uh, situation today. Um, among them, many of them are related to uh, the work of Rudolf Steiner uh, in Anthroposophy, what he calls that subject. Um, uh, and so you can, we can study him today and he can lead us out, I think he has that possibility. In my own life, uh, I had the benefit of uh, working with a man named Michael Harner, who was a teacher of shamanic journey. And, um, and I was able to participate with him on journeys of consciousness into a kind of spirit realm where you meet spirit helpers and they help you. They, they're spirit helpers. You go and you ask a question and they give you an answer. You find the right spirit and they give you an answer. Uh, I realized that you could treat the elements of architecture like they were spirit helpers, like those capitals, the dark ionic Corinthian capitals, for example. Uh, they will talk to you if you have integrated them you have a positive relationship with them. And by integrating them, I mean, you have to draw them. Uh, drawing is what I call psychophysiological. That is to say, it uses mind and body simultaneously. So the whole person is involved. The person that we know physically, but also the person that exists mentally. That's why drawing is so important. Hand drawing, life drawing, very important subjects. Uh, but you can use the elements of architecture as spirit helpers if you can relate to them in a proper way. But whatever path we travel, the world is going to have to be re-enchanted. The sorcerer is going to have to return. We're going to have to bring him back. Okay. And we're going to have to confront the idea of magical animation. Now, human beings don't really have the power to create life in this old system, in the, in the ontological system that I'm talking about. Humans don't have the power to create life. We may in the future pretend that we've created life, but will we have? I don't know. Philosophically, it's ontologically not possible for us. Um, but, we, but what the artist can do is you can, you can, uh, you can create matter, uh, you can configure matter in such a way that it reminds us of life. It gives the appearance of life. And here we see in the, in the, in the myth of Pygmalion that the statue has come to life, um, Aphrodite, uh, he's in love with the statue. He falls in love with his own work. As an artist, one generally, I think, falls in love with one's own work <laughs> to a certain extent. I think you have to, to do it well. Um, to put in the energy that you need to do any kind of artistic creation, you have to be in love. Uh, and so here he is. He's in love with the statue, and, and the goddess has brought the statue to life as a reward. Um, and I always go, to, whenever in this subject, I always go to, to this guy, Louis Sullivan. Uh, now, Sullivan is famous as a proto-modernist. He was, of course, the teacher of Frank Lloyd Wright. So he's supposed to be a proto-modernist. All the modern histories call him a proto-modernist. But he isn't. 
he isn't a proto-modernist. If you read him in a correct way, he's not a modernist. He's a traditionalist who's reviving the tradition in, in his own way. He, he write, In the last year of his life, he writes a book on the magical animation of matter as ornament, right? Called the System of Architectural Ornament According with the Philosophy of Human Power. Um, and in the book, he says, and he wouldn't, if he was a modernist, he wouldn't write a book on ornament because you wouldn't use ornament. So he's not a modernist. Uh, and for other reasons as well. But um, he says that the world used to be governed by magic, which I agree with. I think it still is, but that's another, another lecture. Uh, and then you would expect him, if he's a modernist, you would expect him to say, well, but we don't need that naughty magic anymore. We're going to throw that in the dumpster and we're all enlightened and rational and it can't happen here. And that's, uh, we're going to move on. Well, that's not what he says. He says the opposite. He says here, a new faith is advanced. That's my cursor. A new faith is advanced. That the human being with their natural powers developed and free, and development free, I think, is a reference to the United States, may control their destiny. Now, this was the mission of the ancient mysteries. The uh, initiate of the ancient mysteries was said to control their fate, control their destiny, because they had elevated their consciousness to an awareness of how the universe works. Um, and they can control their destiny through the finer magic of an enlarged vision. So far from throwing away magic, he's calling on us to participate even deeper. And I'm always reminded of this image because this is, was taken by an American with his power, natural powers developed and free, right? Uh, and it represents an enlarged vision of our time, what I call an Aquarian vision, right? An air age vision, a three-dimensional vision. Right. And in the end, Sullivan tells us, remember the seed germ, remember unity, right? What is this? It's a circle with a square inside of it. It's part of the ontological diagrams that I was showing earlier. And this is his work. This is a piece of his work. This guy is not a modernist. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. He's a traditionalist. And he's trying to reinvigorate it through his own incredible efforts. And he was wonderful at it. In the end, he says... All people are artists whose destiny it is to create a fit abiding place, a sane and beautiful world. So that was the purpose of the book, uh, really ultimately the purpose of my work. And again, I wanna thank everyone for staying with me on this and for Paul inviting me. The book can be obtained through the ICAA, through their bookstore, it can be obtained directly from Amazon or any number of other sources. So Paul, if you're around. Yes. I'm here. Question. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Steve. And we use your book uh, quite a lot, actually, in our wow. class here at, at, at UVU. It's, uh, it deserves an entire course, and we appreciate you spending an hour with us and summarizing some of the main points. I love how you approach these subjects through um, symbol and, uh, and story uh, and poetry. Um, it really... Uh, stretches our minds and, and um, challenges a lot of the assumptions that we may have about uh, the world around us. We're, we're going to take just a few minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat. And maybe I'll just get us uh, started with a, a question for you. And uh, it's an easy one, maybe a softball. Is, is there a building that does it for you when you um, visit uh, this, a particular building that uh, it resonates in a way that you, you have that experience of, you know, feeling that unity, that, that sense of um, connection with uh, the harmonies of the universe? And, and you, you, uh, is it because the architect intentionally designed it that way? And uh, tell us a little bit about how um, that is for you, if, if you experience that in visiting buildings. I have. And um, I think the most obvious example is the, uh, the Pantheon in Rome. Um, that's, that, that is a piece of cosmology realized as architecture uh, by an emperor designed in some sense by Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian. <clears throat> excuse me, who was an initiate of the Eleusinian Mysteries. And so he saw the cosmos from this perspective that I've been going at. 
And, uh, and that building is a realization of it. So that's an incredible uh, building. Um, and I think there are other, there are other there are certain Palladio buildings that I've seen in Vicenza, I went to Vicenza. And uh, some of those spaces are extremely uplifting. Um, oh, there's this space in one of, oh, I can't remember which palazzo it's in. But anyway, it's a space that, that you, when, you, when, you, when you walk into this space, you, you have what I would call a classical experience, right? You, um, first you wanna laugh and then you wanna cry. Uh, you, you wanna laugh because you think, wow, it is possible to do this. Right, I'm an architect. This guy was an architect. Um, he was a, a person just like me, you know, not just like me, maybe, but he was a person more similar to me than different. And he did this, and so it's possible. It's possible to do this to get to give people that upliftment, right? But then you want to cry because you realize that if you live to be 110, you'll never, from where you're starting from, you're not going to be able to achieve it. That <laughs> these were much more steeped in this stuff than anyone in this generation is. And there are a number of architects who are working, um, I think we're doing pretty well, but, um, but none of us have really, I think, achieved a, a, that real depth that comes from growing up in a classical tradition. None of us have grown up in the classical tradition anymore. So we have a lot to unlearn. Um, but I think um, if you wanna have a building to start from, I start with the Pantheon. I, I think that's the short answer. Yeah, that, that's a, a really amazing building uh, for me as well. I, I've uh, been to every uh, several times, and every time I go back, it, it really is uh, a, a unique and, and powerful experience. Um, I, I have another, maybe a, a follow-up question then to your um, uh, your answer, which is: so you said that you f you feel this. Uh, and a sense of, of beauty and uh, that joy. And then you also feel kind of a sense of uh, frustration or uh, maybe uh, you feel the challenge of how difficult it can be to, uh, to create that yourself, uh, even after all of these years of uh, doing it and, and designing buildings. So how does one get better at at being successful and actually uh, creating beauty in, in your designs. This is the marriage of Aphrodite and Hephaestus. It's a difficult marriage. You know, it's, uh, um, you just, I think you just have to keep working and you have to let others be the judge of where you've gotten. You have to satisfy yourself and you have to keep, keep learning. You have to keep trying to learn. You have to keep going deeper into history drawing more, draw the elements, draw every kind of as architectural aspect, <clears throat> and just try to integrate these things as deeply as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and again, hand drawing is very, very critical here. Uh, you know, the machines are useful uh, in business and in professional practice. They're sometimes they're necessary, or they can have efficiencies that you couldn't have by hand. Uh, and that's real. But you, the individual designer has to be in charge of this. And the only way you can do that is if you can do better than the machine. So you've got to work to a point where um, you've integrated these forms and even some of the ideas, and then you can begin to have a dialogue with them. That's kind of what I meant about shamanic journeying is that you can begin to dialogue with the elements and they will tell you where to put themselves. <laughs> uh, they actually will speak to you. Um, I really liked how you described it as, uh, you know, the, the arithmetic methods are easy to communicate, right? They're, they're rational, they're uh, easy to understand, but they also kind of tend, tend to uh, cause you to forget some of these relationships, right? And, and forget the, the goal, forget the, the, okay. the purpose of, of and, and you're just becoming uh, sort of this uh, efficient drafter and, and you know, you're dimensioning everything according to arithmetic, but you're, you're losing sight of the geometry. And uh, I found that really helpful as a designer to keep coming back to those drawings 
with the with the compass and square and cre yeah. creating these uh, geometries that uh, remind you of why you're doing it because it can become kind of monotonous and feel uh, kind of dehumanizing, uh, just drawing buildings and dimensioning the same things over and over. Uh, we, we got one, one question from our audience uh, from Sierra. She said, how do you think through producing classical architecture works, uh, can we help others who have not been introduced to the classical orders to recognize the beauty of classical buildings? So what if somebody doesn't think it, you know, they just don't uh, appreciate it? How, how can we help them? I, I, I kind of take a certain position on this. And I think it's kind of the ICA takes a similar position, which is that uh, we don't criticize modernism directly. And th the best way to encourage people in this is to work as best as you can. Um, you know, people, when I was in Notre Dame, people used to do these elaborate watercolors. And they're very impressive. These drawings are very impressive. I know when I was a student, um, I used to just walk the halls of Pratt Institute where I went to school. And I would look at drawings that were pinned up. And I would go to studios and look at, look at the guy's drawings, look at people's drawings, um, and try to be kind of inspired by them, but also to see what this person was doing that was attracting me, right? Um, and I think you just have to work and display your work publicly and let people be attracted and let them show themselves to you. Uh, some people you won't be able to convince. Uh, that's, you just have to accept that. But, other, but most people are convincible. If they see something that attracts them, that's beautiful, right? That's, that has an intensity to it, that has a, a clarity, that has a depth of understanding that's there in the work, they're attracted. And that's the best you can do. Um, I, I, you can't, again, you can't make anybody want these things. They have to want it themselves. And so the best thing you can do is work to the greatest extent, the greatest depth that you can, and display your work. Let other people see your work and let them be attracted. I think that would be what I would say to a student. Yeah, that's great insight. Thank you. And I think on that note, we'll end. We want to thank our speaker, Steve Bass, who's joined us from uh, New York and you, from his studio. And we're grateful for him sharing some thoughts on uh, beauty, memory, and unity this evening with us. Thank you so much, Steve. And we'll see you again soon. And I'm available. If you, here's my email if anybody wants to talk to me. Great. So thank, thank you so much. I hope, I hope we work together more on this. I'm very happy to help. Good night. No, good night. See you soon. Bye-bye.